Father, thank you for this evening and this beautiful weather we've been having. We pray for insight into your word. We uh, ask God that you would grant us wisdom as we always pray and also some discernment and help us to be Bereans and, and really search things out to understand your scripture. And we thank you, Lord, in Christ's name, amen. All right, so last time we were in Revelation chapter 12 and we didn't get out of it because there's so much material to go through and, and this is kind of a not the most complained about and fussed about passage of scripture for um, Bible teachers, but it's still really tedious. There's and so much controversy. I think sometimes we rush through it too much, but it's still very controversial. Opinions vary on it. So let's um, let's take a look here and see where where we were in Revelation chapter twelve. Remember. Um, when we looked at Revelation 12 last week, we kind of decided that this is Antichrist chronology. Um, this is a parenthetic section that tells us who the players are as far as the black hats, um, Satan and his posse, the false trinity, um, so taking a look at this, starting with verse 1, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Excuse me. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And we're going to be discussing that for um, some tonight and probably a little bit next week too. We'll see how far we go. So let's see if we can solve what this is about. And on his heads, seven diadems or crowns. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. You missed it. Three and a half years. Three and a half years, that's right. Oh. 1260 days, three and a half years. So, I have. You, yes, you yes. go right ahead. So, the woman, so was it Israel, gave yes. birth to what? Who? Well, it, it's the promise from the beginning has been um, from Genesis 3.15 to Eve that a deliverer, a messiah, a savior is going to come eventually. Of course, she thought it was going to be the first, firstborn, right? Abel. She thought maybe that was it. And um, Satan might have thought that too, and so Cain slew Abel. But the whole thing has been this plan of redemption that was all about the messiah coming. And so they're talking about Jesus, yeah, the child, yes, from Israel. Okay. So what happens? Now, as we get fast forward further into Genesis 12, 13, 14, and the promise to Abraham that he would have uh, many children and so forth in his old, old age. So you got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? And from Jacob, there were Genesis 37, there were uh, 12 sons, 12 tribes. And how they branch off. And the Messiah is supposed to come eventually 
There's the Davidic covenant where it's going to come through the line of David. And so he, Jesus, when he came, he came through the line of David, the tribe of Judah, etc. So this has been the promise all along. So this is kind of, this is a parenthetical giving us the backdrop of what's going on, but it's also telling us about Satan. Satan there waiting to pounce. And Satan was waiting there to pounce when, when Christ was born. Satan was, um, after Christ was born, Satan was trying to take care of him. And then the first thing that happens when um, Christ is starting his ministry, remember there's the temptation that you know, Satan tried to tempt him and get him to sin, as if. And um, then there are the multiple attempts on his life repeatedly. And then we get to, um, as we discussed in our Sunday morning Bible study this morning about the resurrection, but really the crucifixion and the resurrection and all the effort that Satan put forth to make sure Jesus got killed, make sure that he got locked up in the tomb and that he wasn't going to come out, make sure, so it took all these precautions. So the Romans and the Jews took all these precautions to keep Jesus, Messiah, in the tomb behind a one and a half to two ton uh, stone, he wrapped them all up securely through all kinds of spices and paste and everything, a hundred pounds worth. And um, then he rose anyway. So all that effort ended up being many proofs that uh, if anything, in, in, uh, from the, those days on all the way to now, demonstrate that Jesus really did rise from the dead because there's so many witnesses and so forth. So he's bringing this all up to speed here and what's going on. So that was the male child. And then the male child is going to rule all nations with a lot of iron. We saw that in the first chapter of Revelation. And we'll see that again later on in the book. And then um, he was caught up to his throne, caught up. Hapazo means raptured. So yes, Jesus was raptured. He was caught up to his throne. And then the woman fled into the wilderness. And so now we've kind of made a big leap in time, didn't we? A big time jump. So that's verse 6. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. In some manner, you could say that the woman fled into the wilderness, if you're talking about Jerusalem, a part of Jerusalem, many of the uh, Christians from mostly the... Uh, the Jewish nation um, in the first century. A lot of Jews, probably mostly Jews, were the first Christians. So 70 AD, they had to flee too, right? The ones that were paying attention and remembered the words of Jesus and were reading Luke and so forth. They were saying, oh, we're being surrounded by nations. We need to get out of here. And they fled. And that's pretty much, that's where the similarities end, though, because it says in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days, and that's quite a bit different from 70 AD. So, John is bringing us up to speed and, so and all that. There, the woman being Israel is going to be safe during that time. The reason I ask is because I remember you said it was Israel, and some people thought it was Mary, the woman, and then I had seen a YouTube or something where they said Mary, mm -hmm. so that's why I just wanted to make sure. Well, Mary, I mean, Mary is the woman, and she was Jewish, and she gave birth, but do we see where she fled into the wilderness yeah. for 1260 no, this days? this makes so. more, way more sense. Yeah. Yeah, okay, now. And, and also, when you look at the sign in the heaven, remember, we're looking at the number of stars, and we're looking at the sun and the moon at her feet and all those kinds of things. It looks like Genesis 37 with Joseph's dream. Oh. It's just almost, you know almost word for word. So going to Genesis 37, you have a whole story there of Joseph that he's telling his brothers and they mocked him and was mad at him and all yeah, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Yeah. No, this makes sense. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anytime. Okay. Now, so I know we're covering a lot of material here and there's a lot of controversy mm -hmm. over it. But, and again, we, we discussed last week how some people, or probably most people, will insist that the woman is somehow the church. And there's nothing to support that at all. For one thing, the, the church, how does the woman, the church, give birth to the male child? Who's the male child? Jesus, the church gave birth to Jesus in some way? And you know, none of that 
makes sense. None of the, neither does the 1260 days or anything else. So you've got to spiritualize everything. And then you're in trouble because you start spiritualizing things. Who gets to determine the meaning? You know, I'm going to spiritualize this portion of the Bible, but this portion of the Bible we're not going to spiritualize. Well, this doesn't fit into my paradigm for what we believe and what we teach as far as our eschatology or our ecclesiology about church. So we'll spiritualize that part. It's, it's not, not the way to, not a proper hermeneutic, proper way to study the Bible, break it down, and understand it. So let me get on to verse 7. Now, war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. We don't know if this commenced in 2017 or not, whatever. We just know that there's this war that's being described. Um, and we, we know that it doesn't end until sometime in the future, if, you know, even if it is going on right now. So um, we don't know how long the war lasts. But we know that the dragon and his angels, who are the dragon's angels? Demons, yeah, fallen angels, yeah. Um, but he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. Sometimes it surprises people to think that Satan is not down there in hell somewhere with a bunch of demons with a pitchfork poking people who show up in hell. You know, like they show in cartoons and in some movies. And see, it's not in hell yet. And we see in, in some of the passages we covered last week and in Job um, that he's ever before the throne accusing the saints. But we have an advocate in Christ Jesus. He's our advocate. And he's right there at our defense continually because his righteousness is imputed unto us. So... The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. In verse 10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So we discussed a little bit last week about a scenario or two where it looks like this, the devil, when he comes down to earth, he indwells Antichrist. He possesses Antichrist. And we've seen this before, right? Who did, who did Satan possess before, notably in the scriptures? Judas. Judas. Exactly right. He possessed Judas. He entered Judas. And that was the betrayal of, of um, Jesus. The same kind of thing is going to happen here. He's going to possess Antichrist. That's why I was calling him the Antichrist beast, so we have in our minds straight that um, the beast now is where we see Antichrist in a completely different light because he's possessed by Satan and he's angry and he's got great wrath. So he comes down somewhere in the pro process. Uh, he's go going into the temple. I don't know if he's stopped by and killed the two witnesses. I mean, the whole world been trying to kill him for a while, sending armies to him or whatever, but they were able to call down fire from heaven fire from their mouth, sin plagues. So armies of the earth have been trying to take the two witnesses out for some time. But the Antichrist beast comes and he is able to kill the two witnesses where they lay in the street for three and a half days, right? So I don't know if that happened first and then he goes into the temple and we'll see again coming up in the next chapter, there's another beast and it's the false prophet that we'll discuss. So somewhere in here, in that three and a half days, we see 
the two witnesses killed and we see the setting up of the abomination of desolation, that fake image of the beast that the false prophet sets up and then he'll start his beast system 666 and all that and solidify his global government system, his global armies, solidify the worldwide religion all rallying around and worshiping the serpent Satan. So that's what happens right here. This is the kicking off of the Great Tribulation. So um, the timing is, can be debated a little bit. We know that the two witnesses, that when they begin their ministry is for 1260 days, three, three and a half years. We know that the uh, Great Tribulation, which is the second half of the Tribulation week, is three and a half years, 1260 days. So it could be that they both happen the same day. Antichrist comes into town, defeats the two witnesses. He goes into the temple, declares himself God, makes himself God. And this is before the statue set up and he makes himself be God. And that's the abomination of desolation. And the statue might even be set up the same day. I don't know. But you see three and a half day period and then at the end of this three and a half day period as we saw in Revelation chapter 11 when the two witnesses rose there was a great earthquake that wiped a bunch of people out well we, we uh, see another great earthquake happen here again so it could be that um, you know, this little window here three and a half days I mean it's just a bunch of events stacked on top of each other um, the other earthquake, I believe, is going to be, um, we see that happen when the woman is being pursued into the wilderness, and that's what we want to close off and, and uh, finish tonight. Any more questions about that so far before we go ahead and move on? Um, what's the difference between the serpent and the dragon? Nothing. In fact, one of these passages, it refers to him as... Um, um, here it is, verse, verse um, 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. So you've got them all, the whole bundle of monikers right there. So it's all the same, same being. And this is where we left off last week. So let's resume this and see how far we get. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, but the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, we did cover some of this, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. That could be literally water. It's possible, but I will say, as I think I did last week, that very often water, flood, those types of terms refer to, especially if you're sending a flood after somebody, like a great army. A lot of times a large number of people was, was called, um, you know, it would be called a sea a sea of people. We, do, we even have that kind of as an idiom here in the, in the West. But uh, in particular in Scripture, we see that. Um, what you see on the, the map on the right, it's off oh, here. 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 Petra, just north of that, you see Petra. And this little writing right here says Basra, down the very bottom of the black is Basra. In scripture, we'll, we'll read the scripture for that. But Basra is, looks like looks to be the first stop Jesus makes when he comes down to earth, before he actually sets his foot down on the earth. Remember, he sets his foot down on earth on, on, on the Mount of Olives, and it splits to the north and to the south. Fresh water pours out, goes into the Dead Sea, starts this refreshing. And everything. This is before that, so he's got this loop he makes. And the guess is that, well, he's, this Basra and that area is an area where 
um, Satan won't be touching the saints at that time. It, not in that area. It's kind of like um, the land of Goshen during Moses' day. Remember, the Jews were safe there. And when the plagues came out of the earth and, and Moses was calling forth the, the ten plagues, um, it, they were safe. It was a refuge in, in uh, Goshen. Even the darkness that was on the earth did not touch Goshen. So it was definitely miraculous. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said, starting in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes but war to those who are pregnant and to, to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there shall be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. There's another passage that you might look at. Um, Daniel. Like these people that go to Petra yeah. are going to be some of the physical body people that are going to go into the millennium because he's going to save them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll say, who is the tribulation mostly about? Israel. Israel. So it's mostly Jews. There's going to be some Gentiles. Mixed. There, there's some Gentiles who were saved in the Old Testament days, right? So it's going to be, be that too. Remember, remember when we got to the end of Daniel chapter 9? After all that mess that's going on and, and those demonic beasties came and and uh, the demonic horde that looks like horses came with you know, horse riders and they have a, a head on their tail and they're spitting fire and all these weird things with lion heads, these weird demonic creatures. By the end of that, the, it says that the world, speaking per, pretty much of the, the nations, the Gentile world, they refuse to give up their their sins and um, listed a bunch of them and, and then said that um, uh, they are also on top of that, they went ahead and started worshiping Satan. So that's where the world is at this point. But there's a God always has his remnant. And even among in Israel, He's got, it's just a remnant. It's not, it's not a every last Jew. The land will be saved and he'll have his remnant. Um, I believe it is Zechariah. Um, it might be Zechariah 15, might be 14. I have to look again. I didn't look that up this week. But in Zechariah, it says that, I believe it is, um, half of Jerusalem are saved, they flee, and then for the rest of Israel, one-third are saved. The rest of them, they stay, I guess. They decide, no, nah, man, we'll tough it out right here. But what about, like, the United States? Can people still be saved? Are they watching all this on the news? Well, yeah, I mean, some of them, I imagine they've got to be watching it on the news in Australia or else, and some, I mean, if, I mean, if they repent, they could, but they probably won't live. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. you know, they're going to be martyred. Physically or at the half, um, oh, I was talking, well, well, yeah, right? but then physically, yeah. so this is at the half point. Are there still Gentiles being saved? Again, like I said, it's mostly about Israel at this point. There are yeah. still going to be some Gentiles saved, I'm sure, but, um, so everybody else is just sort of watching this. And, and they're, yeah, uh, whatever. and so they're believing what they want to believe. Selling thing, you need to move to Israel. Probably. I hope you have a friend there that will let you or, go to Petra. You know, that would make a good book, wouldn't it? Right. But no, I mean, uh, what what's going to happen is, I mean, you've got three and a half years of a false peace, and it's still going to be ugly on earth. I mean, it's still going to be before you get to the middle of the tribulation, you're still going to have billions of people die. So, um, you know, you see this, you repent, you should pack your bags, do something. 
you know, because you've but got a, a tough time to go through. Okay, because you're saved. Yeah, you're saved. I mean, you'll, you'll, lot, you'll go to heaven. You'll be one of those tribulation saints, you know, all the martyrs singing before yeah. the throne of God and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not going to be an easy time, you know. So do you want your perfected body, or do you want to live for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom? Well, that I'm and not. and how's travel going to be at that time? I'm just saying. You know, it's. I don't really know. I mean, what you just asked, I don't know how that works. Well, won't there be? Um, we haven't got there yet. Yeah. Tribulation where people are saved or dead, and and, and they won't be able to die. Yeah, it, it it mentions that names that specifically in um, where we have in, in Revelation chapter nine, I believe it was, where the beasties are out stinging people. With, scorpions or whatever they're loose on there for five months and part of during that period is they'll wish they could die and they won't be able to they'll seek death and won't be able to find it yeah uh job the holy man like they, uh, god tested job and job didn't veer away but he was still praying to die through 90 percent of the book so like, yeah even the people that make it they're not gonna yeah they get time like well job and job was a Proactively seeking death, though, in the way of like yeah. somebody taking a gun and going, you know, like this. What happens? I mean, does it just click and God intervenes and you can't do it, or or what? Or people attempt to do some things and they live anyway? I don't. Know, I can't hardly imagine, but it's just going to be, it's got to be awful to be going through that kind of pain. We got so many people just. I just want to end it. It's so painful and it's awful. So, you know, folks who need to repent should repent before the rapture and give their lives to Christ, you know, not take a chance on how it's going to go um, once they're in the tribulation because it, it, there'll be no place in the world except for in the Basra area where you'll be safe. And then why would you hang out and try to do that, try to make your way over there if you can avoid it, you know, give your life to Christ, repent, turn to Jesus, you know. That's a good plan. That's, That's a good plan. If you best. Have, uh, take yourself there to Basra. So the timeline, just real quick, because I know we haven't got there yet, but the That's rapture good. happens, all the Christians are up there, then all this is happening. So then if you become a Christian during this and died, you'd, you'd be at the feet of to Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the yeah. Lord. Your, your um, or, body would still be in the dirt, uh, that dust of the earth still at this point. Your spirit goes to be with the Lord. We see those saints. Um before the throne of God and they're worshiping and singing not during the, the thousand, martyrs. Not during the thousand years. But if you made well, it over to Jerusalem, then you'd be and you made it here, Petra, and during the thousand you. years here. Yeah. You, no, you so everybody's not going to be here for the thousand years? Everybody? Um, or not? What happens with the, with the tribulation saints is a matter up for debate, but it does say that God calls forth the people out of the dust of the earth and so forth. So um, people will debate whether or not the Jews are included in, in that or not, and I think they are, and it depends on the language, the translation you get from the Greek, but we're not there yet in, yeah. in Revelation chapter 20, but this is the fulfillment of all the promises that were promised to Israel back in Genesis. So the elect, the um, Old Testament Jews, they'll be there too. Um, we'll, we'll get there. And I wasn't sure about this. There's some weird wording, especially in English, that comes across strange where it talks about the rest in, in Revelation 20, verse 5. So we'll discuss that. We'll discuss that at length. But... Uh, I think everybody will be there in some form or another. The, the saints, as in the church, the body of Christ, remember Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you and, and in my father's house and my father's room and um, my father's mansion are many rooms. Uh, this is New Jerusalem, and it's identified as the bride to John later on in, in uh, Revelation 21 because the reason why this structure is identified as the bride, behold the bride, the angel says to John, is because it's where we live. It's like um, heaven is identified with God, New Jerusalem is identified with the church, the bride of Christ. He's, 
he points to New Jerusalem and he tells John, behold the bride, now wife. So we're going to have a home there in New Jerusalem. We return with Christ, is what the scriptures say. So we're going to come down, New Jerusalem in this new structure, we're going to come down. So we're going to be above the earth after some fashion during the millennium. We will have new glorified physical bodies at that point. We'll be immortal. But then there'll be mortals that will come forth. There'll be immortals, as in Old Testament Jews, coming out. And they're going to realize and live in old Jerusalem all the promises from all the way back in Genesis. With King David, as in the fulfillment of David, with Jesus Messiah sitting on his throne, on David's throne, ruling there for a thousand years. Yes? When you say everybody, you just mean the saved. Because... The other ones stay in the ground until the end. I'm talking strictly what's called in the, under the category of the first resurrection, which is the all the believers. And it's not an order of events. First category, first resurrection is all the believers. And that's everybody from Old Testament saints to tribulation saints, the church, first resurrection. Second resurrection, you don't want to be a part of. Because that's all the goats. That's all the unbelievers all through time. And they are all eventually resurrected at the end, all of them at the end of the, of the millennium for the great white throne judgment, for final judgment. So, again, that's not a happy time, happy scenario either. So it's good. That's a good recap of, of bringing us all up to date because that's what these chapters are that John's trying to do right now is, is bring us all up to date. This is where we're at, starting with the middle of Daniel's 70th week and the beginning of what Jesus called the Great Tribulation, the last half, 1260 days, and a whole lot of ugly going on. And we, we also know that, that this is the middle too, when we, we saw where there was the announcement and we saw the quakes and lightnings and thunderings at the seventh trumpet. Okay, we, we've already seen that happen, but yet... When we get up into chapter 16, I think it is, where the seventh trumpet actually starts, uh, you know, by pouring the bowls, it brings us back to the lightnings and the thunderings and so forth. So we're at one of those, meanwhile, back at the ranch kind of thing. Let me catch you up with, with the two witnesses and what's going on with the temple and God's holy city. Oh, and by the way, let me tell you where we're at with, with um, you remember that Satan devil serpent dragon guy um let me bring you up to speed with him and where he's at and how he comes into play at the beginning of the great tribulation in the middle of the week oh and i know we've mentioned the antichrist the man of sin the man of perdition um let me show you how he fits together with satan he ends up getting possessed by satan and then we're getting ready to go into, oh, and by the way, there's another one, another beast, and he's got two horns, and he's going to be, you know, a false prophet. And he's going to make this image and stand it up in the temple and profane the temple, and it's going to be, you know, a, a full abomination of desolation, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did uh, by setting up a statue of Zeus in the Holy of Holies in the old temple in the days of, like, the uh, Maccabees, the intertestamental period between the Old and New Testament. So now we're, this is part of this all bringing us all up, catching us all up to tell us, well, okay, what happens to bring us to this point? And, and then the action's going to start moving forward again with the bold judgments and what happens to everything. And it's all pretty horrific, but it's Christ judging the nations as he said he would do. And so it's bringing us to that point. Um, Daniel eleven forty one also tells us, I mentioned that um, Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be spared from the Antichrist. Edom and Moab had occupied, um, they'd occupied what's now modern Jordan. Um, so Matthew 24, 15, and 16, it tells us of this place of refuge uh, for the remnant of Israel. Um, so that's why a lot of people you know, study carefully, and they say, well, Petra is an ideal location. It's probable. Probably not the only location. There's probably other outlying caves. And I understand even during 70 AD, people found all kinds of caves in the hills and things, and they hid in them 
in 70 AD. And so you could see some of that too. You have a bunch of people in Petra, but you might have some people in some surrounding areas. But again, Daniel 11, 41 tells us that, that those people there are going to have a place of refuge. Um, so looking at it from a biblical standpoint, um, Jordan currently has a peace treaty with Israel. Petra in Basra would be an ideal location. Uh, and it's a stopping point, like I said, for Christ on his way to the Mount of Olives. He's also going to stop after Basra. He's going to swing through um, um, the Valley of Megiddo, where we get the word Armageddon. So he's going to swing through there. That's where you get the grapes of wrath and trampling the grapes and blood being so deep at some points, in some points in that valley, that blood will be up to the bridles of the uh, horses. Um, that's a lot of blood, but that's the world's armies. Have, by this point, the world's armies are already starting to congregate there at this location. It takes a while to muster an army. It takes a while to get them all out there. We see, we've seen how many years it took for Putin, for instance, to get all of his troops across 6,000 miles and pull them all together and get them all toward Ukraine and, and stage there. It takes a lot because you've got to feed those people. You've got to um, provide medical supplies and, and blood for those people. You, you've got to um, provide enough room for them to have uh, sleeping quarters and all that. And the energy and the amount of gasoline, all that stuff it takes to move all those troops, it takes time. So even here, by this point, you've already seen where other armies have been moved into the area. And this happened Gog and Magog. They did likely didn't all go home. A lot of them got wiped out, but now the Antichrist is going to be moving more people in because he's still after Israel. So he's not giving up on that dream, and he's going after Israel. So even now we're seeing armies starting to fill that area, and they'll end up in Megiddo, which will be a, a short loop away. So Jesus will stop there before he goes to the Mount of Olives uh, at the second coming. So, um, So Petra is a little bit, it's probably about 20 miles south of Basra. Uh, it's the capital city of the Nebatines. So tourists to this vast mountain-enclosed ancient city in uh, Wadi, Musa, generally enter from the east on foot or on horseback through El Sik, and it's a 6,000 feet long narrow cleft. Uh, the width of that is 12 to 30 feet with 100 to 500 high cliff walls. So you're not going to get a big wide swath of armies going in there to try to evade or invade rather where the, where the Jews are trying to evade. Uh, it's just too narrow. So that's why it was an ideal location back in ancient days. But God's going to supernaturally protect them. Um, tombs and houses are carved into the bedrock over a vast area at Petra, and it'd be suitable for temporary housing for many thousands of people. Actually, I've seen estimates into the millions of people that it's got room for in, in the whole area. It's a, quite a vast area. It has a large theater in there and so forth. Um, Mount Hor is nearby where Aaron died after Moses passed the high priestly garments of Aaron onto Eleazar in the sight of the congregation, and that was in Numbers 20, verses 23 to 29. If you get a chance to look at YouTube or something and, and go look up some documentaries on Petra, it's quite fascinating. It's um, interesting to look at. Unfortunately, a lot of the, the facades have been damaged by the, the uh, Palestinians shelling it they don't believe in having false images and things either, but what they did is they just indiscriminately kind of blasted away at the walls and poked holes in it and everything else with all kinds of shelling. That's unfortunate, but it is going through some renovation um, even now. So Petra covers an area of 263 square kilometers, roughly 50,000 football fields. You can put a lot of people in there. That's larger than North Las Vegas, Tallahassee. It's larger than Knoxville. It's larger than Sacramento, 
Milwaukee, Arlington, Des Moines, Boise, and Seattle. So it's so you get an idea of how big it is. Um, those are some of the trails it shows there on the on the maps that you can see the footpaths. That's one of the tour guide type of maps uh, that you can pick up in the area when you're when you're going on tour. But it's just to kind of give you a look, a bird's eye view look of, of what it looks like. I would encourage you to go and and uh, look at one of those documentaries. So Zechariah chapter 12. But the earth came to the help of the woman. Well, okay, so it goes on beyond that. But the earth, I'm sorry, so it does go on beyond that. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So these are going to be tribulation saints, right? Yeah. The woman and her offspring, and he stood on the sand of the sea. People will debate, became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Does that mean the woman's offspring only Jews, or are there Gentiles mixed in? Some people will say, well, those are also Gentiles. Some people try to say, see, there's proof there that there's um, Christians there at that time, but that doesn't that doesn't hold up because it's talking about the woman again, and who's the rest of the woman's offspring? It's her remnant. It's her remnant. So where would they be if they're not the one tithing? Well, they're apparently they're on their way. And and Satan's pursuing them, you know. So the Lord, what did he do? The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. So whether it's literal water or whether it's an army, God's going to split the earth and swallow them up just like he opened up the Red Sea and it consumed up, which also had water, and consumed up Pharaoh's armies. So there's a lot of similarities there in that regard. Zechariah 12. I hesitate to go on that because it's awfully long. Um, if you look, oh, there's a lot of language of that day, Zechariah 12. Um, if you look at verse 3, it shall happen in that day. And verse 4, that day, says the Lord, I will strike every voice with confusion, etc. Verse 6, in that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan, etc. Um, let's see, going down on verse 8. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the one who is feeble among them. In that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like um, the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day, verse 9, that I will seek to destroy all the nations and come that come against Jerusalem. Verse 19, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me. Ultimately, this is where it's going to be, right? It's at the second coming. Flash forward here to the ultimate end of, of that. And they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son. Um, verse 11 again uses that day. There shall be great mourning in Jerusalem. And it also speaks of uh, the plain of Megiddo in here. Um, in verse 11, verse 13 is more of that. Look at that. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David, and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. Verse 2, in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off the names of the idols. Um, so that language is all throughout here. Verse uh, 4 um, and it shall be in that day, every prophet shall be ashamed of his, of his vision and his prophecies. Talk about all these false prophets, these deceivers, and so forth. And you know, notice the language here is that day. Now, some people, um, you know, who I, I respect as Bible teachers, say that, you know, the only passages that really will talk about the Antichrist will be in... Uh, uh, you know, Daniel, Revelation, and Second Thessalonians. Well, you've got a problem because you've got in Daniel, you got Matthew, you got Matthew twenty-four, you, you've, and 
Um, you also have Luke and Mark, Mark 13 as well, right? The Olivet Discourse that talk about the abomination of desolation. That has to do with the Antichrist. And it shall come to pass in that land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. So there you go. So that is... I will bring one third through the fire, verse 9. We'll refine them as silver refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people and each one I will say, um, the Lord is my God. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself on some of this stuff here. Then we got Armageddon happening right after that in verse 14. So this is all about that period. Um, you go to chapter 14, there's more of this. Um, he names the saints in verse 5, chapter 14, verse 5. Verse 6, he says, It will come to pass in that day there will be no light. And the lights will all diminish. Verse 7, It shall be um, one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at the evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day there shall be living waters. This Here we got the second coming. And there's going to be geological changes. So read through those passages. You've got kingdom coming right after that. Zechariah is very important, very key to read. Um, again, I'm, I'm apologizing. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself on some of this, but I'm trying to help you see the pacing of how all this all this happens. Um, here, let's do this. The, the shepherd, you said. The, the shepherd, we're going to get into the, the shepherd. There's a wicked shepherd coming that's named too. And um, that's what I mean about I'm getting ahead of myself here because there there is a profane and uh, there's a wicked shepherd and what happens with him is uh, there's a lot of debate about whether he is the same thing as the beast in this Revelation chapter 13 chapter who ends up with a head wound because it talks about um, losing it his sight in one eye and his right arm, his right eye, his right arm withered, uh, that kind of a thing. So in chapter 11 in Zechariah, it talks about the worthless shepherd. Yeah. And uh, the worthless shepherd. Um, Go ahead and if you want to read that passage about the worth, worth, yeah. worthless shepherd. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts his flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered, his right eye utterly blinded. Yeah. That's what we're gonna get into, and we're gonna we're gonna get into that. I mean clearly with as much time as we spent here, we're we're not gonna get into all that tonight. But what I want to do is set you up for some of those passages to read about what all is going on in that part of history and, and read those particular chapters in um, Zechariah. This is so much going on about the war and the dynamics here between the, all these characters, these players in this great play, if you want to call it that, on the stage, on the world stage at the end. And we, we will talk some more about the Antichrist. There's a lot of debate about the Antichrist. And um, let me... <clears throat> Write your whistle with this about the Antichrist because a lot of people try to say, well, the Antichrist comes out of Europe, Ten Nation Confederation, uh, European, Union, European Union, you know, Carpathia, whatever, and he's, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed kind of Antichrist, or maybe he's Muslim. A lot of people now, it's popular to say he's Muslim. I'm going to read you um, a couple of things. Speaking of the false trinity, as we go into Revelation 13, that we'll be getting into next week. Um, let me read you some of what I found concerning that, that debate. And we can discuss it more next week, too. But I want to read you some things that I thought were interesting. Um, some of you know who Amir Tsarfati is, right? He's a Messianic Jew, a Christian Jew, um, and Bible speaker. Uh, sometime tour guy. He's in the IDF reserves. I think he's a major. So he involved every once in a while. And he goes on lots of uh, 
uh, goes to a lot of conventions in the speaking circuit and so forth. According to Amir Sarfati, he said, quote, Then comes, of course, the theory which I see across so many Christian books and teachings online, and that is that the Antichrist is a Muslim. As a Jew, I can tell you that that is an unthinkable thing. Think about it. Can a Muslim be, first of all, a world leader? Can a Muslim be a world leader? A Muslim cannot even be a ruler of his own empire in his own country because he's hated by all the others. If there is one thing the Muslims hate more than the Jews, it's one another. You can see that all throughout the world, all across the world. And he says, I cannot see any Muslim becoming the world leader because you're having the Shiites on one side and the Sunnis on one side. And in the fraction of the Shiites here and, and the Sunnis there, by the way, all over the world, when you see the spread of Islam, I'm not sure that the world is convinced that's the type of thing that they want to be controlling them. But if that's not enough, can a Muslim be accepted as a Messiah by the Jews? A religion that is calling for the killing of the Jews. How can it be accepted by the Jews as the one who produce, produces their Messiah? Believe it or not, to be the Antichrist, you need to be first received as the Christ. Do you understand that? What makes you the Antichrist? You're acting like you're Christ. Yeah, not the Jesus Christ, but the Messiah, the Christos. That means Messiah, Christ, it's the same thing. So interesting, can a Muslim allow a Jewish temple on the third holiest site for Islam in the world to be built? So these are fundamental things that one must ask himself in order to consider whether or, uh, it can happen or not. And so articles, and I won't go into tonight, but I will read you one email. Because I contacted a bunch of rabbis and I asked them, you know, what are the criteria? What are you looking for in in the Messiah? Because this is my question. And here's one answer from Chani Benjaminson. He says, hi, Mr. Reynolds. The Messiah must be Jewish according to Jewish law. And yes, he must descend from the Davidic line. And then he says, see the links for further information on the topic, there are some articles in here that I highlighted that some various ones I've seen from some various rabbis. But they are looking for someone of David's line. Now, that cannot be a Muslim. We do have a couple of, like for instance, one of them would be um, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and I respect him highly. He's the one who's been promoting and seeing to the um, more widespread teaching of Israelology. So when you're studying um, theology, you'll go through these books on theology, and Israelology will not be among them listed. More and more seminaries, Bible colleges are starting to teach it because it's such a huge component knowing that culture, knowing the traditions, knowing about the feast days, knowing about the marriage feast, the marriage tradition, all those kinds of things and how to read so much of what Jesus is telling the disciples that they understood because they know Israelology, right? So it's, it's key. But he says, no, he thinks, you know, it'll probably be a Gentile. Um, but he's a believer and he's looking at it that way where, well, it could be a Gentile. But the rabbis, I found one rabbi so far online who said, uh, not really that it could be a Gentile or that it's got to be a Jew. And it was a, a, a liberal rabbi, highly liberal rabbi. And he was basically dismissive of why waste all this time looking for this stuff? It's not important. You know, let's just all get along. Kumbaya. You know, that was basically his take. So then you expect that from somebody an extremely liberal uh, rabbi. But the rest of them are saying, no, he's got to be of the line of David. That's what we're looking for. That's a Jewish law. He's got to be certified by the priest before he can be even declared as the Messiah. So that being a Gentile, Muslim, whatever, it's just, it's just not going to happen. So, so we've closed out chapter 12. Hopefully now we've pulled everything together. We're caught up to speed right at the kickoff of still as far as, far as what we've seen right at the kickoff of the Great Tribulation. But we're still not done setting all this up because now we're going to look at um, 
the beast himself. We're going to look at the dragon, uh, the seven heads, ten horns. We'll compare that with a little bit with Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the big statue. Remember the, the, the big statue with the head of gold and all that, and the bronze vest and the legs of iron and ten toes that are miry clay and iron and all that. So we'll look at all that and see how they're related to each other and what nations um, that means. One thing I'll say ahead of that, though, is I've stressed before because it's like people quibbling over what nations are involved and who kicks off the Gog and the Gog War. It's going to happen. We can quibble over a couple of those nations, but it don't matter because it's going to happen and we know they're coming after Jerusalem and God's going to win and it's going to kick some things off. Same thing here, what religions are involved? Does it come out of Rome? Does it come out of Europe? Does it come out of, literally, does it come out of Babylon? All this kind of stuff. What nations are involved? All the nations are involved. And they're all going to belong to the Antichrist. All the religions are going to become an amalgam of one great, some manifestation of some kind of religions. A lot of people say, oh, it's the Roman Catholics. No. I mean, it might be because you've got Islam. Now it's being kind of a, this mashup together with Christianity and it's Chrislam. And the Pope wants to get involved and he's hugging all these people and kumbaya with all these different religions, including the Eastern religions. So they're trying to bring together this big ecumenical one world religion movement. And it'll be codified when uh, the false prophet comes around and, and unifies it, brings it all together. And uh, the whole world will be involved at that point. So it'll be something, some version that's similar to what we see now, but it'll be everything. And it'll be all nations. So... Uh, the the beast will be will consume the whole earth. This is what we get from from scripture. So, with that, we'll stop here where it's safe before I ramble on into some other territory that we don't. But you can do some research yourself on the Antichrist, whether he's Muslim, Jewish, or some other Gentile race, uh, race or something. And we can discuss it more next week because we're going to pick up there next week and get into Revelation chapter 13. Sound good? Any questions? Any more? We answered them all so far up through chapter 12. It's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot, but it's, it's very cool. All right, let's close. Lord, thank you so much for what you revealed in your word. There's so much here. There's almost too much information. And um, I, I get accused sometimes of opening up the fire hose and blasting out too much information at once. But that's what we have recordings for so we can review. Uh, hopefully this isn't too much. And, and Lord, that we're, help us to be able to process it all because we're going to understand your plans, God, because we're part of your plans in some form or fashion. And we're excited to see uh, this great play, this great orchestra that you set up, this plan of redemption. In including us in all of it, it's it's such a wonder, God. And I marvel that I'm a part of it at all, that you would even think about me, that you'd even care about me at all. Um, it's humbling, and it's for no good reason that I would ever be able to think of, but God, it's a blessing, and I thank you for it. And bless us throughout this week, and keep us all safe, and bring us back. In Christ's name, amen.